Yeah, Rosenberg interviews. Very excited today. And by the way, to everyone watching on YouTube, YouTube, I just want to say, um, to get the entire thing, go on iTunes, subscribe to Rosenberg interviews. That's where I'm going to be putting up all my full interviews these days. And uh, very excited to have a, a true OG in the game, which I'm sure it probably is still weird for you to hear that because you think of yourself as just a hip-hop kid still. But yeah, yeah. Peanut Butter Wolf what is up? in the building. How are you, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Dude, thanks for making some time to come through. You and I have always like connected over the years, um, or over the last five to seven years, I guess, at random times on social media. Exactly. But, but never gotten to interview you before. When I saw you had a gig last night with Prince Paul. Do you guys do a lot of shows together, by the way? No, it's just pretty rare. I mean, we do like maybe like once every three years or something. But yeah, I mean, I, I've known him for, well since the '90s, I guess. So, so I, I kind of wanna I, I want to hear everything that you're doing musically. I know you have um, a bunch of artists uh, right now that you're working with, but I wanted to start the beginning of the story for you sure. and, and hip hop because I really don't know. Um, the first time I became aware with you, aware of you, was in the early Stone Throw days. Yeah, um, like post charisma, like the yeah. loot pack days. Absolutely, yeah, loot pack. That Mad, was Mad Lib. Yeah, because I was a college radio DJ. So the, oh, nice. the, the first thing that I remember ever playing related to you was when I be on the mic. Yeah, that was the beginning for me. But um, take take us back from there. Where where exactly did you grow up in Cali? Yeah. And tell you us, know, take us through the story. Sure. Well, I grew up in San Jose, um, which is right next to San Francisco, but. Um, this guy King Shamik, he he was like the guy that I used to do my demos at his house out of, in San Jose, and then he moved to New York and he started working with production demos. What kind of demos? Uh, no, I was working with different rappers. Okay, yeah. you bring rappers. Yeah, through. yeah, okay, yeah. But I just remember King Shamik moved to New York. He started working with Two and Hype and King Sun, and you know a lot of a lot of um, people on uh, major independent labels. And so we're talking like 88, 89? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my the first record I did was in '90, but that yeah, that was like late '80s, and I just remember he was like, you know, when we were in San Jose, he's like, we're all gonna make it, and then he moved out to here, and you know, in my eyes, he made it because he was working with a lot of the rappers that I liked at the time and stuff. So it really made me feel like if he can do it, I can do it. You you've always been really into underground stuff, um, absolutely. So like, what was the when you were in high school? Yeah. What was the underground stuff? Because now we're talking yeah. mid '80s. Absolutely. What yep. was the what was the un I probably won't know any of it. What no, was the underground it, stuff you know. in the mid '80s? <laughs> um, well, I mean, if if you look at my high school yearbook, uh, my senior quote was "Schooly D rocks the posse," and that was like in '85. And it was all he really had out was uh, Gucci Time and um, PSK, a 12 inch of two songs. You know that that really resonated with me personally. And back then, I guess it was called hardcore. You know, it was before they, they put the term gangster rap or anything on it. But it was like him and like, um, man, just a lot of stuff. Uh, just Ice was another one, you know, like just the real raw stuff, I guess. So were you still checking for, you know, like the Tila Rockets, yours and Absolutely, stuff like yeah, that too? Yeah, all the, all yeah, of it. Tila, all that stuff. But like where I lived in San Jose, like that stuff was really unknown. Like there, there wasn't any radio that was playing it. There was no internet back then. So it was just really like... So was radio just like they weren't playing in the clubs? So was it just like eighties ish pop R and B and things like that on the radio? It was, yeah. I mean, in my high school, uh, Bon Jovi was huge, stuff like that, you know. And when I heard hip hop, it just was so much more raw and I don't know, just more personal. And yeah, was, uh, did the Beasties blow up in your high school? They did later, and actually, I was kind of on the Beasties early too with Cookie Puss, and you so know, of course when, you were on the punk rock side of it. I the, like that. Them. I like that as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was into punk. I was into new wave. I was into all that new order and the Cure and all that too. What do you What do you make of the connection in the early '80s between punk, new wave, and hip hop and stuff that has, to some degree, dissipated since then? But there really was a time when even yeah. All the way, like through early boogie down productions, there yeah. were these connections between the punk rock movement and hip hop. How can you draw a line for people who did not live through it? Why it existed? I mean, I think a lot of it. Well, Fab Five Freddy had a lot to do with it, but a lot of the 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 art kids were really into hip hop too. So he he kind of bridged that for me. I mean, I didn't live here at the time, but you know, just kind of what I was watching and stuff. Like even like uh, the ESGs and the um, Liquid Liquid and stuff. You know how like. They did a, well, they they did like the post punk type stuff, and then Grandmaster Flash did a cover of it later with White Lines, and you know, so it, it was like accepted early on. I think the new wave stuff. Where were you even when you say watching stuff? Where the hell were you even seeing anything? In in terms of you didn't have rate local That's radio. True. It no, wasn't local yeah, radio. Yeah. It wasn't on 
MTV yet, was no, it? I mean, in any it regard? Was, it was just tapes. I mean, I, you know, I, I remember people would bring tapes like, this is the new ish from New York. Like, you know, we all like just worshipped anything that was coming out of New York at the time because we knew that hip hop started in the Bronx. And, you know, I mean, there was a book from like 1986, this guy David Toop wrote. I remember I, I had that and I would write down the, the songs and I kind of learned about like going back and buying older records like Bob James and Apache and all that stuff. So, so when did the digging part start? That started in like 86 because I, yeah, I was buying records in the late 70s as a kid. Uh, but then I started buying older records in the mid 80s. Like that, at that point, I, I wasn't into like the new soul and funk as much as I was into older stuff. Wow, that's so awesome. If the, the idea that you were collecting older stuff in the mid 80s is yeah. such a blessing because the access that you must have had, because at that point, 1986, a record from 1970 is yeah. the equivalent now of a record that came out in 2002, which is not that hard to find. Right, exactly. And, but, and where, you where are, I was in San Jose, it was very hard to find. And I think that that was kind of part of the appeal too, I think. It, so even, so back then, there wasn't like a plethora of used record shops that you could go not pop into all. and find stuff like that. No. So no. how would you go find stuff? Um, I mean, even like if I, like I would go to Long Beach for, or Newport Beach, which is next to Long Beach on vacation. And I remember I would just, just in the yellow pages, like, you know, look at the R section. And uh, the R section would always be pulled out because everyone would want to see where the record stores were. So that was always difficult, too. It was hard to even, hold on, this is something that kids today could never <laughs> even fathom when you download everything. Yeah. You couldn't even find the, the R page store. in the yellow pages? <laughs> they would always, they would always be gone. Yeah, and I'm, think. I'm guessing now, I mean, you, I mean, you probably, of course, at, at this point, know in every city that you go to basically where you want to go. But for me, when I arrive in a city, like next week I'm going to Minneapolis to, for WWE, I yeah. get in the day before the event, and when I arrive, I just go on Google Maps, type in record store, and yeah. just start going. That's it. And back then, back then, <laughs> the no. yellow pages, and <laughs> you like, had to know somebody oh, who knew somebody. That's so crazy. Yeah. So were you um were you collecting at that time seven inches and twelve inches? Or were you just on twelve inches then? Where were you at? By that point, I was buying well both really. Yeah, I mean. Uh, when I started buying records, I was only buying seven inches because that's all I could afford. You know, I was like saving. It was my like lunch what ninety nine cents, dollar ninety nine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I was like nine, yeah, ninety nine. Um, but that's yeah, when I was in fifth grade or something. But like, yeah, by the mid eighties, it was all about twelve inches. No one cared about forty fives anymore, especially for hip hop. Like anything that was on a. 45 or a 12 inch, you would always want the 12 inch because you'd want the extended version. When did you start building a relationship with Dylan? Not until... No, so in 95, um, Shoes came, he like, yeah, he was telling me about him and then it was either 95 or 96, maybe 97, but he he came to me and he was like, uh, I have all these unreleased uh, JD remixes because he would do remixes for Busta or um, I forget who else was on it, uh, D'Angelo, like a lot of people. Uh, but the he would do them for the major labels, and the major label would hear it and pass on it, right? Mm -hmm. So he did them on spec, and so he was sitting on all these remixes, and and shoes was like, let's do this thing, and let's press it up on vinyl. We'll sell it only in Japan, so so the labels in the U.S. don't find out and get mad at us. And and Dilla was part of it; he was cool with it, and you know, so we split the money three ways. And that I think that was like ninety six or ninety seven. And you were like, I can get it to Japan for you. You yeah, already have the link. Yeah, and I flipped a thousand copies like real easy. What was it called? Just uh, JD remixes. And there's an original. Ver was it on Stone? You didn't call it Stone's no, Throne. No, it wasn't Stone's Throne. No, it was. Um, but it was like a green vinyl, I think, or blue or something. And it's just got a bunch of those, which you can find those now on a. A lot they, of, they keep getting repressed. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. It's yeah now, yeah. now they're available. Yeah, you can pretty much find all that JD stuff. But that, that was my first workings with Dilla, and then when Lupac came out, he really was into that, and so we got to talking. And then in the early two thousands, when he was working on his solo record, he wanted to work his his idea for his record on uh, MCA was he was going to rap, and he wasn't going to do any beats on it. Every track was going to be a different producer that he looked up to. And so he, he asked Madlib to be one of them, and Madlib and I flew out to Detroit. And actually, we were supposed to fly on 9-11, and, and the, the flight got canceled. And, and then Madlib refused to get on a plane for months. He's like, nah, I, I'm messing with this. And, you know, we, and we eventually went out there. And um, Is the result of that trip, Champion Sound, is that the beginning of? That was the beginning. But no, yeah, that was for JD's record. But then JD's record got shell. Madlib wrapped over a bunch of jd beats and i think i was trying to get a hold of him for that too but we ended up putting one song on a, a vinyl 
bootleg so I could use it when I DJ. Like, I think we did 200 or 300 Which copies one? of it. I think it was, I think Madlib rewrapped the message over one of his beats or something. But you, you really don't remember the message? No, I, it's arguably my favorite. That may be my favorite J Lib song. Oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> I think God. it was that one. I, 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 I have the, there's a 45 of it. I don't think so. Mm hmm. It's a bootleg then, but there's really? a there's a 45 of the message. Wow. It's the it's the message on one side and JFK on the other. JFK to LAX was on the Yeah, that was on the um wow, there's a 45 of that? Yeah, hold on. Someone must have booted it. Um they bootlegged our bootleg. Yeah, that's but that a, JFK to LAX was on that bootleg also. And then Dilla heard the bootleg and he called me up. And then he's all, you know, his message was something like, what's up with that uh, J-Lib bootleg or something? And, and then I called him back and I was like, yeah, yeah, like uh, we only did 200 copies. And he's all, no, no, I'm not mad. That's cool, man. Let's let's do a whole album like that. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, I'm serious, man, but let's make it official. You know, and then that's where the official song came from. And <sighs> it's crazy. Uh, by the way, you should have this, though, because this bootleg, the, it's, the, there's one... There's five copies on Discogs right now starting at $33. They need it's, it. a, it's a small hole, 45. But oh, yeah, it okay. sounds good though. The message yeah. sounds good. I, I'm tempted. I might try to cut the holes and put that in my jukebox. I love that record so much. Yeah. Um, and then J Lib obviously becomes this incredibly special thing. I mean, and the J Lib album and the Mad Villainy albums, I I, I almost They were think, done at the same time. And they're like companion pieces as a hip hop head, right? And we had to we couldn't put them out at the same time. So we How much time did you give between them? I think like five months or something. Um, what was uh, what was Dilla like as a guy? I mean, you, we I know Dilla was a complicated and interesting yeah. guy as well. Yeah. Um, it's in, to me, it's hilarious as a hip hop guy who is also I, I, we're similar in several ways. Like these passionate, caring about the culture white dudes who really want to be involved and and help with artists and and also do well in it ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I know I know what it is to work with people who can be complicated, brilliant, but also complicated. Yeah. The idea that you were the liaison at some point between the two of them to me uh, sounds yeah. amazing. Well, I think between Hit Madlib and um, Doom is harder because they're both mm. like harder to get a hold of. Like Dilla. Well, Sorry, Dilla was, how did I leave out Doom, yeah. <laughs> who's the most complicated of yeah. the three? But Dilla, Dilla was actually hard to get a hold of too, and I I, I never really called him because I didn't. Um, want to be that dude that bugged him or you know i mean everybody wanted a piece of dilla when oh, when mean, i was working with him even from the late like from yeah. from 96 97 98 yeah. it was it was pretty clear like people want to get a hold of this yeah guy. yeah did you ever get to go to a strip club with dilla he took me to the strip club and uh yeah yeah he took mad when i to the strip club actually that's when we went to detroit that was like one of the first things he did that's what everyone says yeah it was, it was go to detroit yeah see the crib See the get picked up in the Dillalade, you know, go to the strip club in the Dillalade. Like, what What more can you ask for? Are you able to now, like, just sit back and appreciate that you got to, like, have that moment? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those moments. I mean, like, going to the record store, too. Like, that was the thing. Like, I was saying, or I started to say earlier, like, I wouldn't really call him. But whenever he called me, I would answer. And whatever I had to do that day, if he'd be like, hey, let's go to the record store. Are you doing anything? I'm like, no, no, I'm good. And then I'd like cancel my dentist appointment or I'd, you know, cancel everything that I had that day because it was like, you just got a call from God, really. How, and how close did you get with Dilla? Um, I mean, we were close, like, yeah, I don't would you describe uh, yeah, it more I, as a you'd business? You'd almost have to ask him. But would, would you describe it? Would you have to? No, it was no, it was a lot beyond business. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, no, we hang on, we hung out. 